So basically today, hi, I'm Julian De Silva. I'm going to talk about how the oceans can clean themselves, but first I want to kind of talk about ocean pollution and how big of a problem it actually is. So we actually have 8 million tons of plastic that enters the ocean. Make it louder? I think it's just got to be closer to my mouth. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we actually have 8 million tons of plastic that enters the ocean every single year. And uh, most of this plastic actually accumulates in five specific areas in the ocean. I have a picture of it right here. So they're listed in size. So the number corresponds to how big they are. Number one being the biggest, so forth and so on. So these are actually where currents converge in the ocean. And where they converge, it just becomes a giant whirlpool where trash just collects. And they don't get deposited in different oceans depending on how it flows through there. But these five areas actually contain almost 90% of the plastic that's actually contained in the ocean. And so what the idea is now of upcoming technology is to try to use that system of gyres to actually clean up the ocean a lot more efficiently and making it a lot cheaper. So little issue with that is fish, fish birds, everyone come. Oh, that's loud. Fish and birds come here to feed, of course, because this is where there's going to be a big mass of sea life. And with all that plastic there, they actually end up dying. And what ends up happening is the fish will eat the plastic and eat different degraded things in the water. And that actually ends up getting into our bodies as well when we eat the fish. So we actually suffer from this too. Economy-wise, the, uh, actually the United States on the West Coast spends billions of dollars every single year to clean up the beaches. Because if they don't clean the beaches, then people won't come and they make a lot of money from tourists from tourists on the West Coast. So they spend billions of dollars every year to just clean up the ocean and clean up the plastic. And so basically the solution to the problem would be to, you can flip the, the page. So here we have an idea created by Boyan Slot. He's a Swedish engineer. He's about 20 years old. So he's our age actually. And um, he designed an idea that sets up a, a V-shaped array of barriers so here you have like a picture and basically there's just a big orange barrier that's set up in a V it's attached to the bottom of the ocean and then attached to this barrier will be like a non permeable net that stops a little bit before the seabed so all neutrally non buoyant um, sea life basically so any kind of fish don't naturally rise to the surface of the water so they'll get pushed underneath the net while all the plastic which is you know lighter than the actual water will come to the top It'll get collected and then pushed into a central area here. I have a better picture here. Move the picture. Yeah, this one. This is kind of how it works. So this is the V array. The currents would keep circling around and it would pick up all the plastic here. The fish life would get pushed by this actual current automatically underneath our nets, and the plastic would get caught here at the top. Then this barrier would actually funnel all the plastic that gets caught into a central location, and it would get collected and ready for transport. So this, this is basically a way that you could clean up all the gyres in about 10 years. You could clean up the gyres of 52% of the plastic that's actually contained in them at about 4 euros and 50 cents per ton of plastic. So it's actually a very cheap method to clean up plastic and very efficient. Before the problem was that the ocean would take hundreds of years of, you know, and trillions and trillions of dollars in manpower to actually clean. But now we have a way that we can clean it within 10 years pretty effectively for cheap and the recycled plastic actually ends up paying for the idea itself so um, if you want some more information I'll be at the amp club booth over there if you want to look at the pictures a little closer if you have any kind of questions but this is how the ocean can actually clean themselves Thank you. Lovely so this past year I've been doing research on the Bermuda Python in the Everglades with a couple other students here at Barry so um, Burmese pythons is one of the invasive species of the Everglades. They came to South Florida mostly through the pet trade and were released in the Everglades by uh, their owners when either they got too big or out of hand for them. So then they've come and they've grown a lot in the thing because of they're a really effective invasive species. So let me look at my notes here. So. They are semi-aquatic, so they survive in all the ecosystems of the Everglades, so they have a very wide span of land they can expand and hunt on. Um, they also have a high, re high reproductive potential, so that means they, have, they can re reproduce a lot, and they have a clutch size, so they lay about 40 eggs, so that's a lot. 
And then they also have a wide diet, so they can eat almost anything because they've been found to eat mammals of different sorts. They've even been found to eat alligators. And then they also eat a lot of birds, too. So they're really quite a problem because there's been in the news a lot about like how they're declining mammals because of the pythons and everything like that. And then there's also been a lot of python hunting, so they've moved up to 200 or 2,000. They've moved up to 2,000 pythons from the Everglades since 2000. And they keep on working on towards it because there's no accurate projection on like how many pythons are in the actual Everglades right now. So there's no accurate population model right now. So that is actually what we've been working on as a team. We've been working on producing a population model to see like where they are and kind of how they will work. So for that, we looked at the um, birds of the Everglades because we found that they, um, that 25% of their diet comes from birds. So we've looked at the different types of birds and we've, we've used the um, predator pair model, the Roizenrag MacArthur model, um, to create a model. So we've found like different coefficients of like the death rate, birth rate, and like their hunting time and stuff. So we've been able to produce a model. It's not quite as accurate as it could be because it's only 25% of the species. But we're looking into expanding it more and making a type 3 function model. So we add more of the different prey and that sort of thing. So we can do some prey switching so we can get an accurate model of like where they are at. And then maybe in the future we may be able to look into looking into the Everglades and trying to see like if our model supports what is found. But thank you. But fishing line pollution. Um, the issue is the monofilament, the lines, they're made of monofilaments and they're um, they're really strong, flexible plastic and they're used for fishing. And the majority of it is non-degradable, and it takes 600 years for it to be um, dissolved, or it lasts 600 years. Um, monofilament thrown in the garbage cans can still pose a threat by blowing out by the wind or taking out by the wildlife scavengers. Um, the wildlife non-filament entanglements result in drowning, starvation, or loss of flipper or tails. Wildlife ingestion of fishing line often results in illness and death. Abandoned fishing line often poses a threat to divers who become entangled with it and drown. Boaters are all too familiar with the costly repairs required when discarded fishing line entangles their propellers. How can we help? Don't leave the fishing lines behind. If you have unwanted line, store it safely and securely until it can be placed in a recycling receptacle. Never leave fishing line unattended. Cast with care. Survey the area before you cast your line to, ava to avoid trees, utility lines, reefs, wildlife, and other anglers. Avoid casting with dolphins present. They will try and take your bait. Collect discarded line debris and other abandoned fishing gear and drop it off at the nearest outdoor recycling bin or local part participating tackle shop. Maintain your line, check your terminal ta um, tackle frequently for frayed lines. Participate in monofilament recycling programs and or local cleanup efforts. Do not feed wildlife as it encourages animals to approach fishing boats and anglers. Some facts about what they, from 2000 to 2006, 58 dolphins were stranded in Florida with monofilament entanglements or fishing hook ingestions. From 2000 to 2006, 298 sea turtles were entangled in fishing lines in Florida. From 2000 to 2006, 26 manatees were rescued in Florida due to filament entanglements and hundreds of fish and birds and land animals are also entangled in monofilaments every year. That's it. Thank you. Talking about eating locally and the benefits and what and why we should do it. Um, so I think all of us are aware of some of the benefits of eating locally. It creates a local food culture based on what's available. Um, our 
we live in a culture where our bananas are from South America, our avocados are from California, and our blueberries are from New England. Um, with having having that available all the time, we don't necessarily have a local food culture um, based on what's available at any given time and what can be meals that can be created as such. Um, eating locally allows you to cut out the middle people involved in your food production. Um, you get the choice um, as a consumer to be able to talk to your growers, to be able to visit um, farms where your food may be coming from and actually have a say as a consumer to what's happening in your food. Um, it helps you invest in your local economy. Um, as we all know, Walmart and Publix aren't our local economy um, and those are the retailers where we get our food. Um, but by having a say in f um, investing at your local farmer's market or your local community supported agriculture shares, um, you have, as a consumer have a say in um, participating in your local economy. Um, for In terms of vi environmentalism, um, I want to talk about the amount of emissions and what it takes to transport your food um, to get to your table. Um, recent estimates say that average fresh food items t uh, take around 1,500 to 3,000 miles to travel to a local retailer for um, to be bought by consumers. Um, with calculating the six most common air pollutants produced by diesel and gas emissions, we are talking about 40 grams um, per mile for um, gas emissions and around um, 11 mi uh, grams per uh, mile for diesel emissions. O overall, with calculating um, the average of 1,500 miles for gas, that is 60,000 grams of air pollutants going into the atmosphere. Um, and for diesel, that's around 13,000. Um, so just think about that. Um, that ca accounts for 11% of all air pollution um, going into the environment. Um, in the past 20 years in North America, the average plate has become um, a, a conglomerate of um, ingredients from five different countries. Um, and imports from, uh, for food account for, um, have tripled in the past 20 years and account for a quarter of all imported goods. So I want to leave you thinking, how necessary is it to have all of this imported food? Um, do we really need quinoa from South America to have a nutritionally balanced diet? Not necessarily. Um, have a chance to invest in your local farmers and your local community um, and pay attention to where your food comes from and think about what, what kind of pollutants are out there um, when you are Im investing in imported food. So just, just, be mem just be mindful of where your food comes from and how small choices really do affect your atmosphere. Amanda will be speaking to you guys a little bit about how to recycle in college. And Amanda's going to start us off by presenting some very interesting information about how recycling impacts our environment. All right. um, so the average college student produces 640 pounds of solid waste, and that includes uh, disposable cups and paper. Okay. Um, one recycled bottle saves enough energy to run a 100 watt light bulb um, for four hours. Um, and it also causes 20% less air pollution and 50% less water pollution than making a new one does. Um, recycling plastic saves twice as much energy as burning it does. And we throw away 25 million plastic bottles every hour. So, um, with all those fun facts about what recycling does to our planets, Jazzy's going to tell us how we can fix it. <laughs> so how can we fix it? It's a hard question for college students because you aren't exactly living the most, um, the best lifestyle to recycle. So there's several easy ways that you guys can do it, and that's by using the blue recycling bins located all around our campus. Using a reusable water bottle such as this can cut down on the number of plastic bottles that you use. And it makes it, it's really easy and there's tons of water fountains around that you can dice and just fill it up and get fresh water.
And you can also return your plastic bags to Publix, which is really interesting. You just put them, you know, you take them back and you put them in the little bin and that way they can reuse the bags. You can also use a tote bag like this so that you don't use plastic bags when you go to stores. A lot of stores are really appreciated when you use these. As a matter of fact, Target actually, there for a while they had a program where they would take 10 cents off of your purchase when you used a tote bag or reusable bag. And also you can get really creative. This is the fun part. You can take a t-shirt like this and instead of just throwing it away when you're done, you can repurpose it and make it into a tote bag. You can, you know, jazz it up and maybe cut little strings on the bottom. There's a lot of different options and that's not just for t-shirts, of course. It's just your day-to-day -day, like home use items. So with those in mind, hopefully we were able to present you with some ideas on how to recycle and really just help our planet and cut down on the amount of waste. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Chris Riker. I'm the chair of the Florida College Democrats Progressive Caucus, the president of the Barry University College Democrats, and I'm a fellow on campus for the CCSI. And I'm here to talk about water privatization, uh, why it matters, why we should care about it. So first, if anyone asks you whether you'd rather drink water from a beautiful lake like Lake Huron or from a city river with industrial runoff sewage like the Flint River, choose the lake every time. Of course, the people of Flint were not given that option. They probably would have said no thanks to the industrial sewage laced with lead. What makes the Flint River such an atrocious source for water is the high levels of chloride making it, quote, corrosive and extremely difficult to not only manage but to sanitize. Further, the corrosive quality of the water acts like a magnet to lead, L-E-A-D, lead. What you once thought was an environmental and health, 90, health scare from the 70s and 80s, showed up in the drinking water in the homes of children here today, 2016. Lead poisoning, lead poisoning, even at low levels of exposure, is highly dangerous, causing severe cognitive and developmental issues in children. There is a reason that people do everything in their power to keep lead the hell away from them. Those in charge of protecti protecting the people in Flint ended up poisoning the city's children with lead. To be exact, to be exact, Michigan's health officials now say that every child under six in Flint should just be considered lead exposed. Every child. In Flint, the warning signs were immediate. Mere months after the city's water started coming from the Flint River, General Motors decided that Flint's water wasn't good enough for auto parts. So the company struck a deal to have its manufacturing facility receive water from nearby Detroit instead. Now for everybody keeping score at home, that's car parts one, children zero. Governor Rick Snyder of Michigan, elected in 2011 and the former CEO of a computer company, built by the Koch brothers and propped up as a new libertarian Jesus has very little governing experience. He has tapped several quote emergency financial managers across the state in cities that had no money including Flint. Now a law that created this this emergency manager bill was done so in largely Latino and black areas that basically said hey we don't trust your city's government, and now the governor's office is taking over. The governor's office makes all of the decisions. That's what led to Flint, that's what created the climate, and this is why you should be scared by privatized water. Now as a way to save money, one of the managers in 2014 chose to switch Flint's water from the Detroit source of Lake Huron to the Flint River. To ensure that this switch would not poison people and forever change the lives of thousands of children, which we've seen it has, a system to sanitize the water would need to be in place. It was not. The emergency managers appointed by Governor Snyder made the switch anyway, opening spigots of poisoning water across the city like some alternate plot in a Batman movie. In this version, the villains are not masked as lunatics or dark alley criminals but those in charge of managing the city and furthermore the state. The switch was supposed to save a million dollars for the city alone. 
If trading the health and safety of children to save money seems like a deal with the devil, it's pretty close. And just for everybody keeping score again, not only did Flint not save a million dollars, but it ended up losing about five million. The infamous Koch brothers are not the only family that has used its gargantuan fortunes to impact policy for the worse. In Michigan, another family has been throwing its money around to support an ideological agenda that led to the Flint water crisis. To be exact, Flint officials could have prevented lead crisis for $80 a day. Instead, they chose to break federal law. And it's outrageous that this sort of government made catastrophe that would happen anywhere in the United States. This is a quote from Representative Justin Amash, who is a U.S. congressman from, from Michigan, who said, who said during the trial of Flint, Michigan in Congress, quote, the state of Michigan needs to provide comprehensive assistance to the people of Flint and that the state, and that the state has resources. And I can assure you that as a former state legislator. In his characteristic, calm, and collected manner, Amash quickly pulled the painful truth from just two members of the decidedly small four-member panel. The lead contamination of the Flint water supply wouldn't have happened if the city followed the law. Quote, when the switch was made, there was actually no phosphate added at all. No corrosion control. Federal law was not followed. Federal law dictates that in all water supplies, public or private, they must be regulated to counteract phosphates. This was not done. Why? Because water privatization shifts the responsibility and the burden of regulation and diminishes it. There is no regulating private businesses the same way that you regulate government. It'll never happen. First, Amash established that while the state spends a whopping $33 million on its notorious Pure Michigan advertising campaign, it has only shelled out $28 million to make sure the people have pure water. Without using his name, Amash also noted the nonsensical absence from the panel from the one person probably most culpable for the crisis, Governor Rick Snyder himself, didn't even show up to Congress to take the flack. Keith Cree, the interim director of the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality, answered several basic questions from Amash to establish his department's role in the crisis, noting, quote, it's highly unusual across this country for a city to go from one water source to another. Turning to the Virginia Tech environmental and water resource professor and water inter interagency coordinating committee member Mark Edwards, who was the one who broke this crisis, the scope of governmental culpability in the Flint lead crisis became quite clear. We know that not enough phosphates were added to the water to make it less corrosive. What's the cost of treating this water with the appropriate phosphates? No phosphates at all? Nothing. Had they done the minimum allowable under the law, which would have been to continue phosphate dosing, which in Detroit water, it would have cost 80 to $100 a day. Let that sink in. Remember the stated ostensible purpose for switching the city's water supply from Detroit's to that of the Flint River was to save money. And now this is where I need you to be concerned. Flint is not alone. In every single state across the country, there is a Flint. There are a hundred Flints at least across the country right now. Jackson, Mississippi, health officials from the CDC and the state have now urged pregnant mothers to not drink the water at all, to not cook with the water, to not even shower in the water. Why? Infrastructure. For 60 plus years, our infrastructure in this nation has been completely subsided, left out of sight, out of mind, to build more military projects. But I can tell you that our pipes are primarily built with lead. What happens when you privatize water is that the water is less regulated, it goes into these pipes more corrosive than ever before, and strips the lead of strips the lead from the pipes. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. So it's a pleasure to be here to talk to you a little bit about uh, sustainable uh, seafood choices as well as overfishing. <laughs> All right, so great. So um, basically, you know, when it comes to sustainable seafood uh, choices, we also need to be concerned about the issue of overfishing. Now, over the last 50 years, overfishing and unsustainable fishing practices have pushed many fish populations into decline. Over 85% of the world's fisheries have been pushed to or even beyond their biological limits. So strict management plans are needed to restore populations around the world. So what are some causes of overfishing? Well, there are several. One in particular is poor fishing uh, management. Um, this is due to, you know, lack of management, lack of oversight, lack of governmental uh, regulations and traceability of fishing activities has been found a long time, um, a long time problem in the fishing industry. So current rules and regulations are not strong enough to limit fishing capacity to sustainable levels. And we also have an issue where a lot of other nations and other countries don't have access to scientific data that will help them with fish quotas and uh, limiting the, the amount of fish that they are able to catch. Another problem is illegal fishing. So illegal fishing occurs in all types of fisheries within the national and international waters. Illegal fishing accounts for an estimated 20% of the world's catch and as much as 50% in some fisheries. Now the cost of illegal fishing is very significant and it is estimated between 10 to 23 uh, billion dollars annually. Another problem that we have around the world is the lack of protected areas. Only 1.6% of the world's oceans have been declared as marine protected areas and 90% of these existing uh, marine protected areas are open to fishing. So uh, marine protected areas are important because these habitats are then monitored to prevent any destruction to any um, as a result of fishing practices. So what are some current um, fishes that are overfished? Well, there are several. Um, two in particular, like the yellowfin tuna. Um, now these particular fish, they can live up to about seven years and they are highly migratory and are found in the Pacific, Atlantic and Indian Oceans. And they are considered a top predator. Um, so they are at the top of the food chain and they play an important role in maintaining a balance in the marine um, environment. This goes along with uh, the big eye tuna similarly. Uh, they are also con uh, considered as top predators. So we really have to protect these uh, top predators in our oceans. Now one particular uh, fish that I found um, that is currently in, on the endangered species list is the humphead wrasse. Now, uh, they are highly vulnerable to overfishing um, because they are actually val um, are seen as a value luxury food, especially across uh, the southeast region of Asia. Now, one of the neat things about humphead uh, wrasses is that they actually can, uh, help maintain coral reef health. And they actually eat the crown of thorn starfish. And these particular starfish are very damaging to coral reefs. So if we eliminate the humphead wrasse, then we don't have any fish to control these uh, really bad starfish. <laughs> so basically, you know, what can we do to help? You know, what can you and I um, get ourselves involved in? Uh, well, we can choose sustainable seafood choices, okay? So sustainable seafood is a way to replenish our oceans and manage the resources into the future. Sustainable fisheries uh, target species that are plentiful, including those smaller and lower on the food chain, because they can reproduce quickly to sustainable levels. Uh, we can also support sustainable fish farm operations. Now that is, as long as they are environmentally friendly, they minimize uh, pollution, disease, and other damages um, based on their um, uh, systems and the way they go about doing things. Now, what I have with me here, which I am more than happy to share with you, I have a few copies of these. This is actually a um, consumer guide, and I found this on the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch. So basically what you can do is you can just cut this out and you fold it, and then you just carry it with you, um, put it in your purse or your wallet, uh, things like that. And it's actually going to give you a good uh, basic guide as far as what fishes are good to choose from. Like for instance, like the best choices you want to 
um, maybe the crap stone, but you have to make sure that it is from the United States. It's not imported or anything like that. Um, uh, salmon from Alaska and New Zealand are good choices. Um, there's also going to be some other good alternatives that you can choose from, like the mahi-mahi. That's a very popular fish uh, here in South Florida. But you want to make sure that it is, you know, again, from U.S. and Ecuador. You want to avoid the mahi-mahi that comes from Costa Rica, Guatemala, and Peru. So that basically tells you that it, there's either something going on with regulation, they're being overfished in those particular uh, stock populations. So it's a, a pretty neat guide, so I'm going to pass these out uh, once I'm done. And it's just a good start. So whenever you go to a restaurant or the grocery store, ask questions. You know, are, are they supporting sustainable uh, seafood uh, choices? Look at labels as well uh, to make sure uh, whatever fish you're getting, you know, there's uh, no bycatch because we also have the issue when they throw out the fishing nets, they catch sea turtles, dolphins, and um, any other uh, type of, um, you know, marine mammal or, or fisheries that are not targeted. Uh, so basically that's um, um, it. So I hope we can all take a stance and making the right choices when it comes to delicious seafood. Thank you. Hello again, everybody. <laughs> if we all lived like New Yorkers, for example, 7 billion people around the world could fit into the state of Texas. If we all lived like Houstonians, we'd occupy much of the middle part of the United States, from Texas over to New Mexico, over to Alabama, and up all the way to Michigan. How do we know this? Using a subset of data produced by the Global Footprint Network, which has been attempting the tricky business of measuring the impact of humans on the planet since 2003, we can pinpoint how much of our natural world we are using and who wastes the most to a general degree. Ecological footprinting is where researchers look at how much land, sea, and other natural resources are used to, pr to produce what people consume using published statistics on consumption and the amount of land or sea used to produce the quantity of goods consumed. It's wonky, it's complicated, but it's very important. The answers are expressed in an unusual unit, the global hectare defined as a biologically productive he hectare with world average bioproductivity. The average American, according to this model, uses seven global hectares, compared to a global average of 2.7. In the figure, global he in the figure, seven global hectares that allows us to calculate how much land it would take to sustain a population of seven billion defined at different, in different areas. So, the list of countries that use the most will surprise you. And while the United States is high on that list, we aren't number one. In fact, Kuwait uses the most per person in a carbon footprint at 8.9. It would take 5.1 Earths to, su to sustain that sort of living. Kuwait, 8.3. Or Australia, 8.3. The United Arab Emirates, 8.1. Qatar, 7.0. The United States, 6.8. Canada, 6.6. .6. Sweden, 6.5. Bahrain, 6.2. Trinidad and Tobago, 6 flat. Singapore, 5.9. These 10 countries alone will use more resources than the, than the Earth has to give in a single year before that single year is completed. To explain the world's populations and cities a little bit more, if, if all of the people lived, it, lived around the world like they live in Paris, it would only take three states. San Francisco, four. New York, one. London, six. Singapore, three. Houston, 22. What's missing from this model of cities, however, is the land that it takes to support such a city. Cities' land requirements far outstrip their immediate physical footprints. They include everything from farmland to transportation networks to forests and open space that recharge fresh water sources like rivers and aquifers. Just looking at a city's geographic extents ignores its most important ecological footprint. How much land would we really need if everyone lived like New Yorkers 
versus Houstonians. It turns out that question is maddingly difficult to answer. While some cities track resources, most don't. Of those that do, methodologies vary city to city, making comparisons nearly impossible. Plus, cities in most developed nations still use a shocking amount of resources, regardless of whether they are as dense as New York or as vast as Houston. What we can do, however, is compare different countries and how many resources their people and their lifestyles use. For countries, the differences are far, far greater than for the cities. If the population lived, if the world's population lived like they did in Bangladesh, we would need most of Asia just for resources. India, we would need Asia and Africa. Uganda, we would need Asia, Africa, and Australia. China, we would need 1.1 extra Earths. So we would need our Earth and another Earth just to farm from. Costa Rica, 1.4. Nepal, 1.9. France, 2.5. The United States of America, 4.1. We would need 4.1 Earths to sustain the United States way of living across the world. And the UAE, 5.4. Why does this matter? This matters because the resources that we use, the raw materials that we use, all have to come from somewhere. And at some point, we have to stop running out of resources for the year in the first month of that year. The example I'm speaking of is 2015. In 2015, we used all of 2015's resources by January of 2015. And in April of 2015, we used all of 2016's resources. At what year will we run out of resources? And in what year will we wake up and say, hey, this is not a sustainable way of living. It starts with every one of us. It's all a drop in the bucket. Turning off lights, doing this, doing that. We all know what we should be doing because we all have separate lifestyles that we are the ones who know most about. We have to stop creating blanket measures, and we have to start for ourselves and see the change for ourselves. Once we see that change, we can make greater change from a, from a country level and then around the globe. But we cannot, we cannot have any more global meetings, meetings of the world's leaders that come with no results, that come with no plans. We cannot wait for our world leaders to decide when it's time to live sustainable lives. We must live sustainable lives together, and we have to do it yesterday. Thank you. Everyone, um, I was really excited to be able to speak about this. I'm very, very passionate about what I'm going to speak about. Um, I'm going to speak about micro farming, and I'm hoping to convert people here to grow food at home or at work. Um, before the Industrial Revolution in this country, people grew, we grew our own food in this country. And then we had waves of immigration um, come to this creation. We huge, built huge cities up north, and we started industrializing everything. And somewhere along the way, um, agrobiz, as it's called, convinced Americans that you cannot grow food if you do not go to Home Depot and buy a bag of six different things. And it's just simply not true. Um, I am part of the mission, part of the movement to encourage people to grow stuff you eat at home or at work. Instead of a poster, I brought my tomato plant. Um, behind you, you will see what's a suffering in the sun, um, Everglades tomato plant. It's like struggling. Um, but you may not see it below, but underneath there's also rosemary and mint. All of those things are edible. And that plant has cost me zero money. Um, you do not have to purchase a single thing to grow food. Um, the Everglades tomatoes do wonderfully in South Florida. They've adapted over hundreds of years. And I, and soon as it already, I plan to share with my coworkers food that is free, food that is organic and super, super local. It doesn't get more local than outside of your doorstep. And so um, when we think of micro farming, um, it could be in your backyard. Um, you can really get creative and not be limited to what they offer at Publix at Whole Foods. Um, who's ever heard of purple bok choy? 
it's delicious. Um, we grow it at our community garden for free, and we just don't see it in our stores because it's not mass produced, but it is available through seed exchange programs. And so um, with micro farming, one of the, the tenets is to do it really for free. So how do we fertilize our plants if I'm telling you don't go to Home Depot, don't go to Lowe's, then we need to kind of re-educate ourselves as food consumers and food growers is how do we fertilize our soil? How do we go back to giving more to Mother Earth than taking from Mother Earth? And that's what we've done. We've done taking, 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 but we don't replenish the soil. So I'm going to encourage you next time you go to the ocean, don't just get a good dip in the water, collect some seaweed. Take it home and your plants will love it. Free organic fertilizer available in abundance. Um, if you're not composting at home, I had an apple earlier today. No way am I going to throw it in the garbage. I'm going to bury that apple core in my tomato plant. It's going to decompose and fertilize it for free. So that's really is my message is to give back to the soil more than we take from to the soil and grow something to eat. Challenge yourself at your workplace in your backyard. Grow one thing and I promise you'll get addicted and the flavor and nutrition will blow you away. So thank you. Um, so my topic is animal farming and the dangers it represents to um, the environment. It comes with air pollution, water pollution and deforestation. For air pollution, it it releases, the farming releases 37% of methane, which is caused for global warming, twice as much as carbon dioxide. And farming releases harmful compounds like hydrogen sulfide and ammonia that can cause immediate negative health effects in humans. Also water pollution, industrial agriculture sucks up 70% of the whole world's fresh water supplies. And there's also nitrate in those waters that we drink that can cause blueberry, blue baby syndrome and also spontaneous abortions. And finally, deforestation. In the U.S. alone, over 360 million acres of forests have been cleared to make um, more room for crops fields. And it's very bad because the rainforest is slowly deteriorating because of it. And all those facts are coming from the Department of Agriculture. That's it. So how does it come from animal farming? Animal farming. Um, the industries, um, the gas they release for methane, for example, it causes global warming. And the waste of animals, um, their feces and everything, it goes through the water. And in order to filter that, they use nitrate and the water we drink. And it causes blueberry, blue baby syndrome and other health issues awesome. Thank you. Yeah. so to, um, have any of you heard of tree planting burials no, no? Yes. yes isn't that amazing what they're coming up for okay so let me explain it for those that don't know um, so it's um, a new way of um, planting trees helping the environment as well as um, the way um, okay so instead of having tombstones and cemeteries, um, it's a different way of planting trees, helping the environment, and putting um, the, your loved ones that have passed in an egg-shaped uh, pod and act like a seed so the, the tree um, grows, basically. Um, so this is just, I think, personally, um, it's a great way to help the environment and a way, great way to represent a loved one that has just passed and grow into a tree, basically. Um, and tree represents life, so it's a great way. Um, as there's so many cemeteries around the world that take up acres and acres, and uh, it's causing, it's just a different way to help the environment by planting trees instead of having tombstones. Um, so these designers are Italian. They came up with this new idea to be more eco-friendly instead of having tombstones. And um, I wanted to give you an example of what an average uh, funeral arrangement would cost. And it cost 6000 to $7,000 just by funeral arrangements. And, it's not, and that's not even being fancy. Um, and that's very expensive. Um, and planting trees is way... Uh, less expensive. It 
costs between thirty dollars to a hundred, depending on what type of tree. You could even have a loved one grow some mangoes or have a mango tree. That's like a great way. Thank you, mom or whoever you have been buried. Um, it's a way, great way to um, go visit a tombstone through a, a tree instead of. I personally think that cemeteries give me the creeps. Like tombstones, I don't like to visit, but I think if there's like a park full of trees, it doesn't only help you um, more oxygen around the world, but it's a nice way to spend a day and you're visiting a loved ones to represent. Um, so that's my presentation. I hope, yes, it's been going viral um, through social media. Um, they're still, it still hasn't been implemented, but they're trying to make it official. Hopefully a lot of people choose that direction in planting trees instead of doing fu no, uh, traditional funeral arrangements. But I think it's a, just a great way to represent something and help the environment as well. All right, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my environmental issue also has to do with planting trees. Um, is about tree canopy cover and we have all heard at some point in our green lives that planting trees is very imperative towards keeping the environment um, healthy and preserving our uh, green structure and the reason that planting trees is so important is that it has to do with air cleansing, that's a big one. Uh, it filters the air pollutants. It also um, is, serves as a carbon um, sequestration, which uh, sort of impedes the carbon to um, uh, further um, go ahead and go into the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide and contribute toward global warming. So it does help in climate change. And the reason that I'm bringing up tree canopy cover as an environmental issue and more so as a communal, community issue is that there are communities around us that have been neglected in being provided this, the, the, the advantages of having trees. So here you can see a graph that I have that, which shows a correlation between median household income and tree canopy coverage across the city of Miami. So here we have Miami Shores, uh, as we all know, a very high median household income. And with it, we have a pretty high level of tree canopy coverage. And that's a good thing. Uh, we all want to stay healthy and um, be provided all the benefits it brings along. But then we have North Miami with a much lower median household income. And then we see the correlation that it has a much lower canopy coverage. And then we go on to Liberty City, which is a more extreme um, example, which uh, shows a very low um, household income and with it a very low canopy coverage. Now you may wonder why is this, and this, these people already have so many issues at hand. Now to have to deal with um, the neglect of the, tree, the benefit that trees bring along. And this, these folks, the community, are often um, ignored because maybe perhaps they don't bring as much of uh, tourism as other areas such as Biscayne, that they get a lot of trees, not necessarily to benefit the neighborhood, but for beautification purposes. And yet we have these folks who already have a lot of problems to begin with. It could save them a lot in the cause that, that they are lacking so much. So it will save them um, uh, in, in pretty much, uh, it will save them uh, in energy costs because having trees, as said um, previously, you can have a tr uh, trees and it will pretty much have a heat reduction effect. So you won't have to buy, let's say, air conditioning units. And also, also, a way to approach this issue is to plant trees and in sort of uh, prioritize these areas, these communities, and plant trees 
um, because if we don't take the act, then perhaps um, public officials will take their time and not act appropriately. So I encourage everyone to go out to one of these neighborhoods sometimes and plant a tree. You can register at Miami Tree million, million tree campaign com. You can every time you plant a tree, you can register it. We're actually going to do a service event this October of this year. We're going to recruit Barry students to go out um, with us to Liberty City to plant about 50 trees. And we got, we're going to record it and hopefully these people also learn about the benefits of the trees because if you um, take uh, people from Liberty City and ask them, you know, if you give them a, a million dollars, the last thing they will buy is a tree because that's the last thing on their mind. They don't know the benefits and the long-term effects that this will have. So, thank you very Today? much. Today? Alright. Well, other than the part that um, I, w I think food waste can help the poor. I think food waste is a big problem in the United States. We spend about $165 billion on food, wa food waste that we don't even eat. And all that food can easily go to the poor. And the problem with this is that local restaurants and local farms... They throw away these foods that you can see, they look um, oddly shaped or, you know, they look different to us. And that doesn't mean that they're not edible. They just, it's, they don't want to sell it because the, they think the, the consumers don't want to eat it. Well, the poor, they're not going to complain. They're going to want to eat and they don't care how it looks. So there's this, um, there's this act that's called the Good Samaritan Food Donation Act, which prevents the restaurants and you know the farms from being sued even though um, the poor or whoever needs the food would if they get sick or anything they, they're not able to sue so I think that we should take a bigger part in helping them do donate food another problem is when all these unwanted fruits and vegetables are thrown out into the environment they go to landfills and what happens is when they de decompose inside these landfills it creates methane and methane is um, a lot more po um, potent and creating heat inside this world. And that causes global warming and something that we don't need and can easily be avoided by simply help donating food to the poor or actually eating these vegetables and fruits that we don't eat, which is a big problem. Another thing is with the amount of food that we, that we waste, it can fill up to 750 um, football stadiums, which way too much food that should be wasted. So in my, in my, in my head, I think we should take more of a step to, to use this food and actually help other people who actually need it. 49.1 um, million people are, have households that don't have enough food for them. So I think we live in one of the best countries in America and we should easily be able to solve this problem when people are starving. So there we go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.